So welcome colleagues. I'm really happy to have just one day after the end of COP this webinar on the outcomes of COP26, a very interesting COP and the huge interest in our webinar, which really overwhelmed us. We were never thinking that more than 400 people would join and still people are coming in. So let me get going. Just a few housekeeping announcements. If you have questions, and we would really like to accommodate a few questions because I am a firm believer in dialogue and interaction, write your question in the chat. There will be colleagues sifting through those. And then at the end, I will try to answer a few of them. It's clear that I will not be able to answer everyone, but um, at least some discussion I would really like to have. We'll have a recording of the event that will also be distributed. I've been asked by many people who couldn't make it at short notice, they would like to see the recording. So this will be made available. So for those who want to have the recording and also the slide set, please subscribe to the Perspectives newsletter. Also, if you know colleagues who would like to do that, uh, feel free to forward this uh, link to them. We want to share this widely. We think that good COP analysis is a very important public good and therefore would like to spread it as far as it can be done. So um, I will first look into, of course, what were the formal tasks of the COP. Then I will elucidate the strategy of the UK presidency. I will discuss a bit what a COP means in pandemic times. You see the picture on the left, uh, which was in all the sanitary equipment at the COP. I will, as usual, in the past, look at external influences that have impacted the COP. Then I will look into ambition and the UK side deals that relate to ambition then finance, then of course the elements of the Paris rule book that were still open and fortunately could be concluded at this COP. Then the two topics, loss and damage and adaptation that were a bit sidelined, but all, even there we had some progress and then get into our outlook for the future. So here just for those who are not doing climate policy every day, the big mountains of the climate policy journey, starting from the UNFCC, Kyoto Protocol, Marrakesh Accords that actually implemented the Kyoto Protocol. And then the big failure in Copenhagen, which led to uh, several years of soul searching, followed by the Paris Agreement in 2015, probably the peak of international climate policy. Then in 2018, the Katowice decisions generating the rules for the Paris Agreement like the Marrakesh Accords did for the Kyoto Protocol. And last but not least, less than 36 hours ago, the Glasgow Climate Pact. Now, of course, every COP has a long list of agenda items. And the formal agenda items were finance. So we have a gap of the 100 billion target, how to close that gap and the start of the post 2025 climate finance negotiations, very important topics. The second task was relating to the update of the NDCs, formally that was due last year, but due to COVID it had to be postponed. And of course, uh, countries have to develop long-term strategies. Then pathway towards the global goal of adaptation, operationalization of loss and damage, international cooperation, the three mechanisms under Article 6, the reporting tables for transparency, the common timeframes for NDCs, and also, and that's often forgotten, such items like work programs for education capacity building. That's an issue that is, for example, seen as very important by the research organizations that form the constituency of the Ringos, where I'm serving on the board. And this has been a discussion we have been really involved in. And then a topic which was also very visible at this COP, local communities and indigenous people. I've rarely seen so many people dressed in the attire of the different indigenous people. They were really very well represented at the COP. And then we had the UK presidency led by a flamboyant politician. And this politician at the Biden summit in April gave four topics he wanted to resolve. Coal, 
cars, cash, and trees. After April, of course, that was a bit refined. Another initiative came in on methane reduction. Then, of course, the UK has been a strong partisan of net zero. It is following nature-based solution. And also for the industrial areas of the UK, carbon capture and storage is seen as an important issue. So topics that not necessarily fit directly with the formal agenda under the UNFCCC. Now, which were the elephants in the room? And on the lower right, you see a nice elephant being set in the entrance hall of the COP where we took a photo because we thought it's a really apt symbol. So of course, finance, adaptation, and Article 6, these were the really big elephants, but then we had loss and damage, uh, common timeframes, and then DC updates as the smaller ones. And of course, as usual, there are many crosslinks. Nothing is agreed until everything is agreed. So, of course, we have been in a pandemic for two years now. And many people doubted whether this COP could actually be held. Even when I booked my plane to Glasgow in September, I got a bargain of 150 euros Frankfurt Glasgow return. And I thought, why? why? Nobody's coming to the COP. And then I saw the participants list, or at least the provisional list of participants, nearing 40,000, which is a new record, much more than anything before. Paris had just a bit more than 30,000 and the runner-ups around 20,000-ish. And all categories of actors were having a record level. The governments, the observers, and the journalists. So a huge thing, and on the ground one felt it. On the right-hand side, you see the big queue uh, on the third day where people were waiting for three hours to get into the venue. On the upper left, you see the big security fence with the policemen and the turnstiles like getting into a football stadium. Uh, yeah, it was not always easy. And you see the big dome with the huge globe hanging from the roof, which was somehow the iconic place to be. And in the middle, you see the prospectus team in front of the nice planted cop logo. Now, which were the external influences on this COP? We had several positive influences. We had a huge amount of public pressure. The demonstration on the Saturday was bringing more than 100,000 people to Glasgow. The whole main street was filled from the beginning to the end. And in many other cities around the world, there were also a lot of demonstration. Then in August, we had the IPCC six assessment report publication, at least of the natural science portion. And this is a portion which is really alarming. You see here just the graph with the different emission scenarios. You of course see the dark curve, the historical temperature increase, which has crossed the one degree mark. We are at 1.1 degrees and yeah, 1.5 is not far away. And then, of course, we had the negative influences, COVID. Of course, governments are fighting with COVID every day. As I speak in Germany, we are getting into a critical situation again. And of course, we have a huge amount of geopolitical tensions, especially the largest economies of the world, US and China. And you will see that this very negative thing turned into a very positive thing at the COP, which was a big surprise and very deft diplomacy from these superpowers. How was the spirit of the negotiation? The spirit was not univocally positive. There were positive elements, there were negative elements. So of course the UK presidency had learned from the mistake of Copenhagen and from Paris. So they set the heads of state segment early, which was good, it set a very ambitious tone. So that was very clever strategy. Then two things marked in red, which were less than ideal. The logistics was definitely chaotic. Accommodation was extremely difficult to get. And anyone who was waiting in queues between eight and nine in the morning was suffering. I was very lucky. I was living 15 minutes by foot. So I could get in at 6.30 in the morning. I didn't suffer, but many people suffered a lot. And then the third bullet, which was really problematic because the access to the negotiations were not, not given. 
the negotiation rooms you see on the bottom left, the set out of a typical negotiation room, very fast paced, uh, big tables, uh, very distant uh, because of COVID restrictions. So in the first days, one was trying to test it out how it could work. And eventually one settled on the rule that one person per party could get into a room, but only one observer per constituency, meaning one researcher, one environmental activist, and so on. And this is definitely not equitable. It made life very difficult um, because, yeah, you had to really arrange in an extremely coordinated manner. Now, of course, as the COP progressed, it got better and better still. The text production was marvelous. Every day, new text, uh, text getting rid of brackets, uh, at least in those streams that I followed. There must have been an excellent coordination between the presidency and the secretariat. The one big innovation was we didn't have the all-nighter. Normally, Thursday, Friday, Friday, Saturday, you sit, you wait, you hope. But this time, there was a nice communication at 8 o'clock evening Friday. Yeah, nothing will happen tonight. Well, of course, there would be something behind closed doors, but nothing for the whole crowd. You go home at 8 o'clock, the new text will come out. At 10 o'clock, there will be the plenary. The text really came out at 8.30. The plenary took a bit more time, but that was a great innovation. And I hope that the following cops will use it because everyone was well awake on Saturday when the critical things happened. And of course, we had a fair amount of drama and huddles at the end. On the upper left, you see the big huddle of John Kerry with the pink tie. You see Franz Timmermans from the EU, a few Chinese negotiators. You see myself in the upper left corner. And we were debating the coal power subsidy language. And it was a really interesting debate. And there were other debates. You'll see more of them. So many more huddles than we've seen in the past, but fortunately, a happy end. Now on the big topics. First big topic, ambition. And there again, um, the UK presidency did a really deft diplomacy. There was a huge stampede towards net zero targets. And one region in the world, which nobody would have really counted to publish net zero target, did it in the week in the run up to the COP. It was the United Arab Emirates for the year 2050, Saudi Arabia for the year 2060. And then at COP itself, further countries came in and a big surprise, India. Well, the target date, of course, is not extremely impressive, but the fact that the country which is as poor as India is willing to do a net zero uh, announcement was very positive. Of course, there was a frantic assessment estimation of what does it mean? And uh, the International Energy Agency came up with nice curves and um, estimates. You have them here on the graphs. So you see the yellow curve on the lower left graph, which is the sum of the pledges as per COP. Uh, the red one is the pre-COP uh, pledge summary. And on the, bottom, on the top end, you see the yellow 1.8 degree. Of course, this has generated a lot of debate. And some other institutions think that the 1.8 degree is too optimistic. But I hope that, of course, now all the models are running and the different big institutions are calculating. So we'll see, hopefully, in the next weeks, more analysis of this. But, and a big but, the short term is not as impressive as that. The NDC updates have really remained patchy, and I would say they are insufficient. For example, China didn't do anything on the NDC. So we see on the upper left, uh, the UNFC did an, a very quick update of the synthesis of the NDCs. You see the red element. That's NDC, conditional, unconditional, uh, the range. And you see for the first time, the conditional NDCs point downwards. That would mean the global peak of emissions would be past us. But you see that, of course, the gap to the two degree or 1.5 degree path is still make massive. And on the lower left, you see the emissions gap report, which of course could not take into account the new NDCs, but you see it's still 10 to 30 billion tons in 2030, and this is massive. 
But we've seen one ray of hope, and it's a big ray of hope. And this was a big surprise for me. I was thinking, wow, how does it happen? In the second week, eight o'clock evening, we were sitting at the COP, nothing much was happening. And suddenly I got a tweet from a journalist saying, I'm writing on the US-China declaration. I thought, what? US-China declaration? Because I remembered very vividly the US-China declaration 2014, which was setting the stage for the Paris Agreement. And now it was exactly the same type of text the same people, Kerry and uh, Sia Chanchua, writing it, saying clearly we collaborate very specifically on technologies, even getting as specific as uh, direct air capture. And there I was also quite impressed because China doesn't have direct air capture so far. Um, so, and it has one very interesting statement, which says that from 15th uh, five-year plan, coal use will go down. And that is from 2026 onwards. So essentially, this means China has shifted the peaking year from 2030 to 2025. And of course, also, it says Chinese NDC will be updated in the next one, two years. And this led then to the new update round of NDCs by 2022, a key result of the Glasgow COP. So very nice surprise. Now, of course, the UK presidency didn't count on such surprises, but wanted to be able to show that they are having an ambition COP, regardless of what would be the official outcome. So they did the yeah, cars, trees, cash, and so on. So the first one was on coal. A number of different initiatives brought together. The most interesting thing was the $8.5 billion pledge for the South African just energy transition. It's the first time that there is a dedicated program for phasing out coal in a nation which is really dependent on coal like South Africa with a significant price tag going way beyond anything pledged so far for a single country with a beautiful title, Just Energy Transition. So if this works, it is a blueprint for other countries. So I'm really hoping that those who have designed it will get going very quickly and serve as a good example. The second one relates to the 100% zero emission transport that was less successful. The major car manufacturers didn't sign it, but at least it's a starting point. Then we have the declaration of forest and land use, which talks about halting and reversing deforestation by 2030. The language is fluffy, so apparently it was easy to sign for many countries, but at least one can make a reference to that. And what I found the most interesting one beyond the coal activity is the methane reduction. Because methane reduction, 30% uh, by 2030, a nice numbers game. And there one can really do something. And what I found particularly interesting is the $328 million pledge by big foundations to underscore this methane pledge. Now we get into what actually was decided at the COP. And a lot of attention went to the so-called cover decision, which essentially is nice language, but of course it is not the gist of what the COP does. But of course all the media, all the NGOs focus on these cover decisions. So the one really good thing about the cover decision is the statement that there is the aim to strengthen the NDC target and I hope that China will march ahead and other countries will follow. Then there was of course the big thing, again unprecedented, usually you have Nothing is agreed until everything is agreed. And once everything is agreed, you don't reopen the text. Here, for the first time, the text was reopened and it didn't fall, which again shows the really great diplomacy that was an operation. And I was sitting in the plenary, I was walking around, I was going to see the huddles. And there one really has to say, John Kerry did it. John Kerry went to uh, really dampen any fire that would erupt. He was patient, he was calm, whereas others were shouting, he was never shouting. And he somehow managed to keep everyone on board. So India was not happy. Already in the initial intervention in the plenary, India said, we don't like the text here, we don't like it there. And I thought, this is it. 
But fortunately then, uh, Timmermans gave a passionate speech uh, for the EU, followed by many other passionate speeches, so the mood in the plan returned. But still, India was adamant, they didn't like the text, so they wanted to change one word. They wanted to change what is reading phase out of unabated coal power and efficient, inefficient coal subsidies to phase down. Of course, phase out means zero and phase down means reduce to some level which is not defined. So this was brought into the text. Uh, Switzerland complained heavily about opaque process. I can understand the Swiss and the EU, but it would have been a pity to kill all the rules just for one statement in the preamble. So I think it was the right way. And of course, what was also very good is how Sharma apologized to the delegate, said, yeah, sorry, this is not how it should be done normally, but yeah, I wanted the deal and he, he got the deal. Good, a few interesting uh, terms in this cover decision. So clean power generation, just transition. Not much on renewables because that was contentious with some countries. Then the methane reduction being mentioned, nature, the deep regret on the inability to mobilize the 100 billion, uh, and indigenous peoples were mentioned, which of course was important to many. On the lower, uh, the picture you see John Kerry, Tim Mamans in the middle, and in front of me, because I took the photo, the two Chinese. Now the Article 6 rule book, and of course that's my favorite topic, and uh, so I will get into some detail here. We have tried for now six years to get this done, and it's a third attempt. Uh, you see the small button I brought, all I want for Christmas is Article 6. It was already minted in Madrid. I brought it back, unfortunately now it was granted. Uh, there are the three types of international cooperation under Article 6, so Article 6.2, which uh, provides uh, the possibility for bilateral approaches to international carbon markets, then Article 6.4, the multilateral crediting mechanism, which is to many extents the successor of the CDM, and the non-market approaches that are often forgotten, but that are important for some countries, especially in Latin America. So what one needs to say that uh, this um, climax was built very carefully because over the whole year, there were very technical deep negotiations, trust building, everyone knew one on the first name and uh, yeah, it was like a big family and you'll see the family photo will come in a few slides. And now, of course, the rule book is there. It enables rapid implementation of international carbon markets. Of course, now we see, need to see that we get the rules implemented with high integrity. But what is extremely important, a necessary condition for that is that there is a common understanding that comprehensive capacity building is needed. Now on Article 6.2, what do we have? We have a really robust accounting framework, which was not clear from the outset. There is a very good link to the transparency framework. What is clear that the so-called corresponding adjustment, CA, it needs to be applied for everything, for inside and for outside the NDC. This is extremely important because that was a big fighting point in Madrid and even before. Um, what is also clear that all the units, regardless of whether they are used for the international airline system and even outside uh, the official systems, uh, they need to have an authorization by the host country. There's one rule which uh, generated some frowning, which was negotiated between the EU and the Arab countries which is quantification of policies and measures in terms of greenhouse gases, which are then ring fenced, and the rest of the NDC can be in other metrics. So that uh, needs to be seen how to operationalize it. What is very important again for the environment integrity is that there will not be banking of it most between the NDC implementation periods. Then there had been a lot of uh, problems created by Papua New Guinea and the Rainforest Coalition, which suddenly brought in a blanket clause that everything in red plus should be 
covered under Article 6, even looking backwards, credits from 2015. So yeah, it was had never been mentioned before and suddenly it came up very late. Fortunately, uh, this was uh, prevented. And now, of course, one can do red plus, but one needs to do it subject to the normal guidance. Uh, then we have the reporting review cycle, which of course needs to be operationalized. What did not happen is to get a tax on adaptation on Article 6.2. And that was actually the reason for the huddle you see on the upper right between the African group, Bayer from Senegal, the head of uh, the African group from Guinea and John Kerry. Because you know, the US was adamant that there should not be a formal tax and the Africans they were adamant they wanted predictable adaptation finance. And the deal was that the US uh, carrying his intervention on the floor would mention a clear statement that the US would significantly increase adaptation funding, which was delivered by Kerry and therefore the African group accepted. Then we have overall mitigation, also not mandatory, strongly encouraged. And we have some language on human rights and indigenous people. 6.4, now again, the body of the rules looks very stable. So what is clear is that the supervisory body will have the full say. And the host countries can do also, of course, rules that are more stringent, but they cannot do everything they like. They still need to refer to the supervisory body. Then we have a carefully crafted comp compromise on the corresponding adjustment for 6.4. So uh, whether the corresponding adjustment is undertaken depends on the host party authorization. So now, of course, we need to see how the host countries deal with this uh, heavy responsibility. But yeah, that was the compromise that was needed to get Brazil and others on board. We have very nice language on additionality and baselines. Uh, so we can now build a beautiful system, which is stringent. We have a good share of proceeds uh, for adaptation at 5%. And of course, the monetary contribution for administration and a very nice automatic rule that means that you cannot accumulate uh, big treasures in the UNFC coffers, but that uh, the money goes to the adaptation fund if it's accumulated. For the overall mitigation global emissions, there is a 2% cancellation. And again, uh, the first start for really implementing this uh, approach. We have an independent grievance process, which of course is very important for the stakeholders. And also the supervisory body can apply safeguards for human rights. What we have is a very lenient approach for the CDM transition. So any CDM activity that still has a valid crediting period can transition. There is no limitation according to vulnerability or other conditions. There are certain deadlines, but they will be manageable. The methodologies can be applied also until 2025 or the end of the crediting period, and then will be the prioritization for the programs and small scale activities. Regarding transition of the CDM credits, the CRs, uh, the decision was that those activities registered after 2013 can uh, have the CRs used. There is, of course, a big academic debate about how many this would be. The estimates range from around 30 to more than 300. So we need to see especially how many projects that were dormant are now waking up and generating CRs. But overall, one can say strict basis of rules and lenient transition. Article 6.8, there we now get a Glasgow committee on non-market approaches, which, the, as, which serves as a contact group and which is now to work on certain focus areas. We have the list of three focus areas and there will be a web platform. Below, you see the family photo of the Article 6 negotiators, which I mentioned before. Now, second big topic, transparency. And transparency, this was very technical because we related to these long tables with many rows and columns where you enter your information on the national inventory. So what is now being done is that there is a notation key that is called FX for flexibility. 
so that uh, the countries can now specifically enter where they need flexibility. A big debate was on the funding that would be provided for the reporting. And now for the, the Global Environment Facility, uh, we'll have specific guidance regarding the support. And it has been noted that uh, further funding is needed. And I think industrialized countries are very aware of this. With regard to the legal status of these tables, um, we have the situation that uh, all the tables uh, in the common reporting format are now mandatory, so there will not be a bifurcation between developed and developing countries, which is important because it preserves the spirit of the Paris Agreement. And we have confidentiality rules. This is problematic because, of course, we may see a situation where yeah, the confidentiality rules will be used too much. Uh, when we try to analyze the CDM credits that are still remaining. We were really hurt by the very far reaching confidentiality interpretation of certain national registries. So this is definitely problematic. And then with regard to adaptation, uh, adaptation will not be covered by the technical expert review, which is fair because yeah, countries voluntarily report on adaptation. Um, and with regard to the IPCC inventory guidelines, um, this is quite interesting and a bit disturbing because one would like to have a process which automatically brings in the new guidelines as they come. And of course, the 2019 refinement is very important uh, yeah, to actually operationalize the latest knowledge uh, in the context of the 2006 guidelines. So now it says voluntary use of the 2019 refinement, which yeah, doesn't really leave me satisfied. What is good is that there is a link between the compliance committee and the expert review. So if there are significant and persistent inconsistencies, the compliance committee can act. Uh, what is, of course, less impressive is uh, loss and damage financing was seen as dangerous. You will hear about that later. And therefore, the reporting of that is also not really fully uh, set. So it has not been added to the financial support tables. Now the third important open issue on the uh, Paris rule book was the common timeframes. And this had really been intractable over many years. So the big question, five years, 10 years mix. Uh, so there were still many, many options that were given to the ministers. And then fortunately, again, it was possible to get an agreement. And I like the agreement because essentially it uses the five year time frame, but yeah, backwards. So saying for the 2035 NDCs, um, these need to be communicated 2025 and then in the five year periods. Um, the problem, of course, it's non binding, but yeah, that is built in the structure of the Paris Agreement that everything regarding NDCs is somehow non binding. But what is also good is there's no explicit flexibility provision in the final text. So we have to hope that this is standing and stable, but at least it's going into the right direction. Now, Finance has, of course, been one of the really difficult problems, and oh yeah, the negotiations were unsurprisingly very difficult. We had the clear statement, for example, the OECD report. You see the left-hand graph, the latest OECD figures for the year 2019, showing that only $80 billion were actually mobilized. And this is figures that come from all the countries themselves, and many of them are highly problematic. So in reality, the mobilized climate finance is probably significantly lower. Now, of course, developed countries understood that this is a major issue. So on Monday before the COP, they submitted a climate finance delivery plan, which says, yes, we are late, we know it, but by 2023, we'll reach the 100 billion and we'll reach oh, even almost 120 billion in 2025. So yeah, it was taken up as a statement uh, which uh, generated positive responses. So what is now being done? One will do the assessment in the year 2027, where the data for 2025 can be fully assessed. Of course, there's now the challenge how to link this to other long-term climate finance issues. 
what is now mentioned specifically is the aim of doubling adaptation finance, but there are no firm guardrails for this. So as usual, finance decisions are fluffy, but I would say, given also the statement of various large developed countries, we are on a track to get more financing and also significantly more adaptation finance. With regard to the post-2025 collective finance goal, yeah, I thought this will be really intractable, but again, it was possible to get a relatively good outcome. We get an ad hoc working program that is to work now very intensely with four meetings per year for the next three years, inclusive process, access for non-state actors, no prejudgment about yeah, what will be the level of the goal. Well, South Africa for the AGN published numbers of 700 to $1,300 billion per year. Well, but at this stage, once you just start the negotiations, it's really premature. What is also very important is that there is a deadline now for 2024 to conclude this, which means the COP in 2024 will become a very important finance COP. One topic which didn't really advance much and uh, developing countries were angry in a justified manner is loss and damage. So of course the developed countries didn't want to hear anything about finance for loss and damage. So there is now an outcome which says, yeah, some funding for technical assistance can be given. Well, it's not that impressive, but what is interesting and of course will be the starting point of a real negotiation is the dialogue to discuss arrangements for the funding of loss and damage under SPI. So I would expect this dialogue to develop quite some traction in the next years. And there was one thing, funny thing, uh, funny in a sense that of course the scale was really tiny and also it's a subnational government, but that Scotland offered 2 million for loss and damage funding. I think it's the first government entity that has done so. With regard to adaptation, uh, we now have a work program for the next year. Um, which of course means that the conference in Egypt will definitely become an adaptation COP. Methodologies, indicators, data, so interesting work ahead of us. So yeah, but this means this has been put on the rails. With regard to adaptation finance, again, I already mentioned uh, doubling of adaptation finance and there were interesting announcements also. We have to see how this IMF facility, which at least on paper is huge, what it can actually deliver. There were some really specific announcements for the two large international adaptation funds that are mechanisms of the convention. So the adaptation fund itself got the largest replenishment ever, 350 million. Very interesting, even non-developed country, Qatar gave a contribution to the adaptation fund, which is a very interesting signal. And then the least developed country fund even got more than the adaptation fund. But of course you see these are two very large uh, contributions from Germany and Belgium. But of course an important sign for the least developed countries which otherwise also, yeah, some of the decisions were not really in favor of the LDC. So at least they got some good funding here. How did the media react on all this? It's interesting to see, yeah, it was a mixed reaction. No media wrote, oh, it's complete failure. No media wrote, it's a great outcome, which of course shows that probably the UK presidency did really a marvelous job of uh, staying on the middle ground. Of course, the local press was very relieved that uh, Glasgow was not a failure. Uh, some uh, UK uh, newspapers yeah, uh, wrote about India and China being the, the bad guys. Um, I like the New York Times uh, statement uh, that the world remains far from, well, limiting, well, from stopping warming, I would say. And of course, interesting to see the Indian headline, the coal compromise pushed by India. I would think hmm, it's probably not really that they pushed a compromise. So what are the key messages? The first message is now we have a firm basis for delivering on the Paris Agreement. It's like the Marrakesh Accords were a firm basis 
for the Kyoto Protocol to be implemented. We have now detailed reporting requirements for all. That's very important. So we didn't re revive the developed, uh, no, uh, yeah, the developing country bifurcation. And everyone knows that a lot of funding is needed to get this working. We have really robust rules for the international carbon markets. And I'm happy that we didn't get a decision that had weak rules and a cutoff of the CDM, but that we now have a decision with strong rules and also getting uh, some trust for those who develop CDM projects, hoping that they would get credits for 20 years or even, even more. And we have a clear five-year NDC ambition cycle and, of course, more urgency with this update of the NDCs in 2022. And again, yeah, I hope that China leads the way. Regarding climate finance, we have more money on the table. Of course, the trust has been strained by the inability of the developed countries to fulfill the 100 billion target. And of course, there is a sour note on the loss and damage. A really sour note. So I think de developed countries need to get something going at the next COP on this. Otherwise, the finance negotiations for post-2025 will be really difficult. We have a clear signal on increased long-term ambition and everyone is talking about 1.5 degree target, two degree targets almost forgotten. So yeah, interesting convergence. We have, despite all the fuss about the phase out or phase down, an unprecedented language on fossil fuel phase down. And in essence, we will have a short term emission gap, but it will be getting smaller. And the question now, can public pressure technology development get it really so small that we have a fair chance to get on the 1.5 degree target? So what are the next steps? Of course, now the rapid start of Article 6 and CDM transition needs to get going, that the trust in the markets is really kept. For next autumn in one year, we'll probably get an adaptation and loss and damage COP27 in a beautiful location, Sharm el Sheikh. I hope it will generate a kind of spirit like in Bali. You don't have to run through rain and clouds. So let's hope that it will be a nice and beautiful COP. Then we get what I would dub the Global Stock Take COP in the United Arab Emirates. Of course, Global Stock Take is an important thing to do. Let's hope that it will be meaningful, that it will not be like the demonstrable progress check of the Kyoto Protocol, which was initially thought to be important, but then immediately forgotten. And then we will get a finance COP in some Eastern European country. And I really hope that we don't get Poland because Poland has had three COPs and has never been able to really push a COP. I would hope that the European Union is able to give to another Euro Eastern European country, which is eager to do something on climate change, enough money to really have a good COP. With that, I would just like also to introduce our experts who can support you further on some of these issues. So myself and my colleague Aglaya on NDC ambition, my colleague Stefan, who has a lot of experience in developing countries, particularly Africa on capacity building for Article 6, myself and Aglaya on negotiation support. We supported four countries at this COP and it was a really great experience. My colleague Hanna Mari from Finland on voluntary carbon markets, Sonja Butzengeiger, co-founder of Perspectives on uh, the implications of the Glasgow outcome for planned registered CDM projects, implications of the Glasgow out outcome for new Article 6 uh, by Aglaya and Sonja, then issues related to new energy technologies, for example, hydrogen by Sonja, my colleague Matthias Krei on private sector engagement, Igor Shishlov on climate finance, and Matthias Honegger on negative emission technologies. And of course, if some of you are eager to find a new interesting working environment, we are always interested in getting good applications from people who think that solving the climate problem is important. With that, I would like to thank you and I would like to open the discussion. So Yuli, please get the questions up. Yes, Axel, I would like to start with a more general question on the Article 6 operationalization. Um, it was asked, what is your view on how long it will take to operationalize Article 6? It took us 
the better part of seven years to get the CDM after Kyoto. What time horizons are we looking at here? Even for Article 6.2, there seems to be a lot that needs to be in place before we can try to transfer IPMOS and do corresponding adjustments. Please share your thoughts on this. Yes, thank you. This is very pertinent. That's why I put this rapid start of Article 6 as the key thing. Uh, 6.2, of course, we now have a quite thriving landscape of piloting. So I think these pilots will just now gather steam. And uh, so there I have no doubt that Article 6.2 will materialize very quickly. We've seen how, for example, Switzerland has been generating bilateral agreements. And now, of course, given the rule book is there, this will accelerate. 6.4 is the big challenge because how can we have a process where the capacity building will be set up sufficiently flexibly that we don't have now the behemoths of development cooperation taking three years to develop a work program. So we now need a versatile collaboration of think tanks, consultancies and funders to get this moving very quickly and some very nice at, uh, approaches have been, for example, regional alliances for carbon markets. There's a West African Alliance for Carbon Markets, East African Alliance for Carbon Markets, and they've already changed a lot in the context of 6.2. Uh, so I really would hope that we can do this quickly. And also we'll be shortly launching initiative to generate Article 6 tools that can be plugged upon CDM methodologies to make CDM methodologies fit for Article 6. So if there are funders in the room, please approach us. The program is ready. We can get rolling, but we still need some money. Okay, thank you. There have been many questions coming in on what um, this Article 6 rulebook means for the voluntary carbon market. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit further on this, Axel? Yeah, this is very interesting because in the final plenary, I was asking Perumal from the Secretariat about the language, what it means for a voluntary market. And he said, well, it has been crafted in a way that it can many thing, mean many things. And now it's upon us to interpret it. So to actually, yeah, have it clear, what is the role of the authorization? So can a host country now make a blanket authorization for credits on the voluntary market that then doesn't, don't need a voluntary, sorry, a corresponding adjustment? Or would the, would the country say, no, I don't want to give such blanket authorization. So I will only authorize with corresponding adjustment. I will see a lot of uh, competition between the various uh, voluntary market standards uh, to try to operationalize this. So I would hope that in the next six months, we will get a fruitful engagement of the players on the voluntary market, how to deal with this rule book. But it's clear that, uh, yeah, the interpretation of the rule book uh, depends also on fine legalistic language. And I'm not enough of a lawyer to really give the final statement on this. Then there have also been many red plus related questions. I know you already addressed it quickly on one of your slides, but could you please elaborate again a little bit on where red plus projects fit and also jurisdictional programs? And yeah, do they fit under Article 6.2, 6.4 or 6.8? Well, 6.8 is open to anything, but of course cannot generate credits. So anything on results-based finance can go under 6.8. So that's easy. Uh, 6.4, of course, the supervisory body has to agree on a methodology. So I would invite everyone who wants to get Red Plus into Article 6.4 to set up consortium. And as soon as the supervisory body is operational, submit a Red Plus methodology, and then we'll see what happens to that methodology. And with regard to 6.2, of course, yeah, countries are free to do whatever they want, but they need to report. So yeah, let's see which countries are willing to buy red plus credits under an article 6.2 collaboration. So again, I would invite the coalition for rainforest nation to find some countries who would like to buy. I've been talking to the minister of Gabon on his plan for selling red plus credits. It seems that Gabon, for example, is well developed, has well developed ideas. So yeah, I would hope that at some point we see the red plus 6.2 coalition. So yeah, the deal is open. Uh, let's go for, for it. 
Okay, then we have also a very interesting question for all of us working in this field. Why is Greenpeace claiming that Article 6 is just greenwashing despite a seemingly, seemingly decent rulebook? And what should the carbon market community do to engage with these critical voices in a constructive way? So with regard to, of course, the interpretation of the outcome, it's clear, well, it's clear that there are interpretations say, oh, the outcome is not uh, high integrity and others who will say it is. I would clearly uh, tend towards those who say the outcome has high environmental integrity. I just note that Lambert Schneider issued a blog um, this morning where he also tends into that direction. Of course, he discusses the voluntary market potential loophole where we have to see yeah, what is the fine legalistic interpretation of the clause and corresponding adjustment, at least as I read them, I find them relatively stringent and robust, but yeah, the, we have to see what the lawyers say on that. So overall, I would think the carbon market community can come out with head on the shoulder and say, yes, this is something on which we can build our work. And I would invite all those who are in favor of high integrity carbon markets to join forces and show the world that these carbon markets are actually able to deliver higher ambition. Okay, then we have also a country related question. How do you assess the Brazil effort at COP26 to influence the negotiations? That's very interesting because Brazil was surprisingly quiet. Everybody thought that Brazil might again be the spoil sport as it was in Madrid. But already before the COP, there were clear tendencies from enterprises in Brazil who told the government, please don't destroy our carbon market, we need it. And that's how Brazil behaved. They were never in the forefront of uh, opposing important rules. They didn't push on the outside NDC accounting question. So Brazil was, yeah, I would say a positive force in these negotiations. Julia, I can't hear you, sorry. Yes, now um, we have also CDM transition question. I understand that CDM discontinues. However, nobody wants to wait until 2025 to get the credits issued. What possibilities exist in this regard? Well, what is clear is that CDM could not be done for entirely new projects. But of course, what is also in the decision is that the temporary measures of the CDM continue. So that means, of course, that you can still submit stuff under the CDM, but of course you are subject to a risk that it may not qualify for 6.4. So there is no value of death, at least as far as I interpret the decision. And of course, I'm happy to take other views on this because that was one of the questions where I thought, hmm, it's not fully clear because you need to read the CDM decision on the CMP side and the Article 6 decision, how they fit together. And yeah, I think there we need probably a bit more analysis, but yeah, one cannot do everything within 36 hours. Okay, then we have a more overarching question. According to you, what are the teeth, if any, for encouraging countries to improve their commitments every year before the term of the next five year cycles set up in the Paris Agreement, starting with this year? Good question. Well, essentially, this relates to diplomatic pressure. I think, uh, yeah, what John Kerry did, he uh, flew around the globe, meeting leaders of important countries, trying to convince them that enhancing ambition is a good thing. I sincerely hope that the US continues this kind of diplomacy. I hope it will be joined by other countries uh, and blocs, including the EU, and, I and also, of course, the streets. If you have Fridays for Future demonstrating in the capitals, uh, uh, Green parties winning elections, then this is the best means to uh, uh, increase the ambition of NDCs. So do the political background work in your own country. Okay, and then um, we have let's say one or two final questions. 
Um, one is a specific banking question. So no banking of ITMOS between NDC implementation in implementation periods. How would this work out in practice? Well, this of course depends on uh, their reporting system being foolproof. And when we did our study on the unused CRs, we saw that there were a lot of zombie units from the first commitment period lying in national registries. So of course, uh, it needs to be pre prevented that the decision of, of Glasgow, which seems clear, is subverted by uh, subsequent interpretations. So, but I think the EU is very vigilant in this context. And so I hope that this problem doesn't uh, come up again. Okay, and then I think one final question. Um, how can ITMOS for credits from outside an NDC be applied to a host country NDC? Or will this only be applicable to the buyer party? Well, I would say, why should a host country go the complicated route through uh, Article 6 or the voluntary market? It, if it wants to use the mitigation for itself, it can do so directly. It doesn't need to make a turnaround through the market. So I've never understood this argument that it's so important to regulate this. So if you want to reduce the emissions domestically, do it. It will be accounted in the NDC. You don't need international carbon markets. It's a bit like shooting uh, through your own back. I can take a last question and then I conclude. Yes, let's take a finance question at the end. Um, here it says, Article 6.2 decision, par uh, paragraph 18, takes note that the implementation is subject to the availability of financial resources. What is the funding gap? What sources are first foreseen considering the uh, required fast implementation needed? Well, of course, we have now some funding that is coming from the CDM surplus. So the RCCs are getting 10 million for capacity building. So that's a first step. But I now would hope that the various uh, countries who want to buy credits, and I note that Germany, for example, has pledged 10 million for capacity building support as well. I know the Asian Development Bank has having programs. So I just hope that these coffers were open quickly and we'll develop a nicely aligned capacity building program that covers the next two years. It's critical. So yeah, I would like to thank everyone for joining this webinar. Uh, having had more than 550 participants, it's uh, unprecedented, at least in the uh, company history of perspectives. Please feel free to shoot questions in writing. Feel free to get in touch with us if you have need for um, deeper analysis. Of course, also, if you disagree with some statements, it's always important to have good discussion. I hope that we'll be able to um, actually promote discussion and interaction. And I am very happy that we have had a successful COP and that we can now continue on the way towards uh, an ambition, mitigation, and uh, the 1.5 degree comfortable world. Thank you very much.